Good afternoon. My name is Fred Buzo, uh, AARP California Associate State Director. Welcome to everyone who is joining us live. Today we are here with special guest Robert Cochran, award-winning filmmaker and director and producer of the Boys of Summer documentary series and two Stephen King-based short films to talk about his work and caregiving journey. We encourage you to share this stream now on your own social media page so interested friends and family may also participate in today's conversation. Also, please feel free to ask questions you may have for Robert or myself in the comment box. We will answer a few questions live toward the end of today's conversation. AARP is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that works on behalf of 38 million members nationwide and 3.3 million members in California to enhance the quality of life for all people as we age, which includes supporting and advocating on behalf of family caregivers. To that end, AARP California is thrilled to have Robert with here with us today. Robert, before we begin, can you tell us a bit more about yourself and your work? Well, first off, Brad, thanks for having me. Uh, in terms of uh, the work in general and me, I've been a filmmaker for about 25 years now and uh, spent the first five making more of the narrative works, things like the Stephen King works and uh, a couple of uh, films that got a little play out in Hollywood and then had a transition when uh, dad was diagnosed with Parkinson's in the early 2000s. I was a fan of documentaries, but uh, had never made any. Uh, at that time, uh, a couple years uh, into his diagnosis, the opportunity to make the first Boys of Summer uh, came about. Uh, and, and by the way, when I say came about, it was because I decided to make it. No one was asking me <laughs> to make it. Uh, we, uh, I was inspired by the field of dreams and uh, uh, that feeling of, I don't want to have this feeling of regret. I don't want to have this loss of dad. We always meant to go to all 30 ballparks together. We don't know what Parkinson's is going to look like for you, not knowing much about it at all. So let's make sure we take care of what we can take care of in the time we know we have. And uh, by the way, let's document this because other people might benefit from the story. So, you know, that was really uh, the beginning of this. And uh, again, that was about 2004 when we hit the road. And we took that summer to go two months, 20,000 miles and see a game in each of the 30 major league ballparks. and. We learned a lot about Parkinson's that summer and a lot about just the, the generous spirit of human beings uh, who found our story and embraced us and let us live in their, their homes for a day or two and uh, give us meals and, uh, and join us at the ballpark to celebrate this journey. And the film was well received, which was great. The, uh, the idea at the time was, you know, we're going to be done uh, with this project. It's a one-off because everyone was pretty sure that there was going to be a cure for Parkinson's within 10 years. Unfortunately, we know that didn't happen. And so in 2014, uh, people were asking my dad, they were asking me, how's your dad doing? And, you know, I was generally confident that he was doing pretty well. But uh, I said, you know, maybe it's time to check in and, and maybe, you know, do a 10-year anniversary sort of film about this. And I have kids now, bring them into the fold. And as we started to make that film, it became clear pretty quickly that some of his symptoms were more progressed than either of us had really considered. And that was, uh, that was really what the second film was about, was stepping out of that, you know, when's the cure coming, knowing that basically that's out of our hands. And of course we wish and pray for that to continue happening. But what can we take control of in the meantime uh, to better quality of life? And it was at that time that I realized, oh, guess what? Uh, and it really, upon the screening of that second film, I'm a caregiver. And I didn't really even understand myself being in that role. And it's not that dad was needing a lot at that point, but he was starting to need some things. He was starting to need more. And the reality of he's going to need more and mom's going to need more, uh, that, that I need to step up who I was and what I was in their lives for them. So that was a really big discovery part of the second film in 2014. A couple of years later, we went ahead and, and followed up on that to where we made Shortstop, which is the film we'll be screening on Friday with uh, your help and, and the help of the A's. And that film basically gets us into the celebration of quality of life and how we can do better together. And the through line of baseball plays through all three of the films. And there is love and there's family and there's support and, you know, sometimes difficult conversations and then a lot of laughter, too. And, uh, you know, discovery and transformation that happens 
within all of this. So I continue to be uh, thrilled and delighted that my dad is kind enough to allow me to document this and uh, that it is received as well as it is. Well, I, well, I can I tell you, tell you Robert, Robert, as a, as a, as a big as a baseball, baseball fan and as a son of a father who, who loves baseball as well, I, I really admire you for doing this. And so I just want to you know, put that out there and, and just tell you that I, when I, I was really you know, touched by the, uh, by the film and so um, loved it. And for those of you who are out there watching, you can catch a screening of the film this Friday, March 12th at 6 p.m. Uh, that's right, AARP California and the Oakland A's, as, as Robert said, uh, are excited to partner for a free virtual screening of the documentary series, Boys of Summer uh, by Robert. As mentioned, Boys of Summer chronicles Robert and his father's journey with Parkinson's disease and how they use the power of baseball to connect. Before the screening, you will hear from Oakland A's team president, Dave Cavill, as well as Robert Cochran, who is here on with, uh, with us today, director and producer of, of Boys of Summer. Following the film, you will have an opportunity to ask Robert questions and hear from an AARP representative to learn more about available caregiving resources and tools. The virtual event is free and open to the public. You can register online at www.bosmovie.com. We will also drop the direct registration link in the comments right now. So Robert, how was making the film with your father as he began to face some of the challenges of Parkinson's disease? And also for folks tuning in today who may not know a lot about Parkinson's disease, uh, what, what can you say about it? Well, sure. When we started, dad was considered early onset. He was uh, three years into his diagnosis and he wasn't showing a lot of symptoms at that time. I, I you know, by having a close study of him, by spending two months in a car, 20,000 miles with him, I could see he'd slowed down in places. He'd get tired a little more easily, but generally speaking, he, you know, he didn't look that different. In fact, <laughs> in some places, I almost had to convince people as we were going around looking for help. He really does have Parkinson's. <laughs> um, so uh, we we went ahead and uh, we, we we learned. You know, we saw people in various stages uh, of the disease at that time. Uh, Ten years later, yes, there there was a lot of progression. And and one thing that I've learned about Parkinson's uh, that I find very instructive is that it manifests differently for every person. Uh, so the old saying is that if you've met one person with Parkinson's, you've met one person with Parkinson's. There are certainly some similarities that many people have, but not everyone has, say, the tremors, and not everyone has necessarily the freeze ups, and you know, not everyone has cognitive uh, issues or you might get any of those things at different times. It's a very cyclical disease, depending on how one manages uh, his or her medication. And uh, a big thing we've learned along the way too, that's positive, is there's an awful lot you can do uh, to maintain quality of life through some very manageable things, the, probably the, the most key of them being exercise. Uh, there are studies that have shown definitively that exercise regular at a certain level over a certain period of time uh, can decrease symptoms by as much as 35%, which is just, that's a game changer. And mm -hmm. it, you get everything else you get from exercise anyway. So that's why it's such a battle cry uh, within Parkinson's to let people know, uh, A, let's not be ashamed of this, which a lot of people are, or they're scared when they first get diagnosed. And then B, let's get active together and get inspired together uh, so that you know you can manage what you have and that you can live the best quality of life. So you know th there are a lot of problems along the way based on the fear. And uh, I do a lot of work with that. I'm actually, I'm studying for my PhD uh, down at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas right now, looking at the effect of improvisation on Parkinson's. Uh, because the, what people have a hard time with, as I mentioned, uh, a number of people is isolation and depression. And those two things uh, can be very cyclical. They can drive people down fast and can even lead to falls uh, out of lack of confidence, out of lack of getting to the gym if you're not feeling that you ca you're capable, uh, that lack, lack of self-efficacy. What improvisation can do and what's fun, and this does come up in the film as well, uh, and it'll come up even more in the fourth film, talk about that in a moment, is it gets people to be present and understand that they have 
all they need right now in this moment, and maybe more than they were giving themselves credit for. And along the way, they have fun, uh, there's a lot of laughter, and uh, a lot of exploration, a lot of teamwork. So that's what we've done with the improvisation programs I'm building, and I'm very proud of those and, and hopeful we can continue to grow those uh, throughout my work. Yeah, thanks, Robert. You know, you, you just mentioned the, uh, the fourth film. And so, you know, in, in, in terms of developing the entire documentary series, wh wh where are you at? So this third film, Shortstop, and we're going around the bases. Uh, there is, you know, the first film was not called First Base at the time, but for sake of uh, argument, it is now. Then there's Second Base, uh, the second film. Shortstop is the film that we're screening on Friday. Uh, we're planning Third Base which uh, we are hoping to shoot the opening scene for this summer at the Field of Dreams movie site. Uh, we visited in that first film, the actual Field of Dreams movie site in Dyersville, Iowa, and it was, it was even more than we could have mm -hmm. hoped. It was absolutely beautiful and magical and anything you would have thought about having a catch with dad was even better. Um, and uh, that's actually a picture with my dad and my son Giuseppe. <clears throat> And uh, that one, it, it may look like a Field of Dreams. That's in Walnut Creek, where uh, Dad lives, and, uh, and I grew up. And uh, it's on top of a place called Lime Ridge. And uh, we shot the, uh, the posters for the uh, first and second film and the fourth film there. And uh, the third film, <clears throat> excuse me, has a slightly different poster, but uh, that, that, that shows the generations and the way, you know, one of the things we try to bring to the film. Uh, as far as the fourth, uh, you know, we will be shooting the opening scene at the Field of Dreams, uh, what we're calling the Boys of Summer Celebration, on July 25th, COVID willing. Uh, of course, the world opens up the way we hope it does. And uh, it is a public invitation. There's information on the site, bosmovie.com, if you'd like to join us and happen to be in the Dyersville area or want to plan to be there. And uh, we'll be doing things like uh, a home run derby, which will benefit a local Parkinson's group. We're going to have great dueling piano sing-along featuring uh, my sister and the composer of this film, which is amazing uh, if you've ever been to a sing-along uh, piano event. We're going to be uh, playing, of course, pick up baseball on the field of dreams. We may have the ghosts uh, there, the actual ghost players themselves who are in the film. They do a, a great routine. We're hoping they'll be involved. And then we're going to have uh, an epic game of catch. Everyone's going to be playing catch right at sunset. We're going to do this drone shot, lifting up out of the field into the sun uh, and cap the evening with the screening of shortstop that night on the field itself. So it's going to be a beautiful celebration, and that'll be the beginning of the fourth film. And there's much more to come after that. But, uh, yeah, we're, we're in action uh, with what we're doing. So you get to see the third film, and then you get to see where it's headed uh, very soon. Yeah, that's great, Robert. Uh, you know, for, for fans of uh, Field of Dreams, right, you always, you, always, you always have to have a catch, right? you got to have a catch with your father. That's key. Yeah. And, um, yeah, that's, that's just awesome that you're going to be doing this. And so looking forward to what the future brings. You know, again, for those who are just joining us on the live stream, my name is Fred Buzo, AARP California State Direct, Associate State Director. Today we are here with guest Robert Cochran, award filming, award winning filmmaker and director and producer of the Boys of Summer documentary series to talk about his work and caregiving journey. If you have any questions for Robert or myself, please put them in the comments. So today, you know, more than one in five Americans are caregivers. And when looking at caregivers for adults only, there are almost 48 million Americans providing care to a family member or friend uh, age 18 years or older. So family and friends are the backbones of America's care system, providing the bulk of care for older people in the United States as they strive to live independently. If you are not currently a caregiver, at some point in your life, you are more than likely to become a caregiver or need a caregiver. Many family caregivers don't think of themselves as caregivers, but um, they are in fact caregivers. And so uh, they are the sons, the daughters, the spouses, the friends, just doing what families normally do for each other. But a family care caregiver is defined as someone who is providing unpaid short-term or long-term care to a parent, spouse, friend, or other adult loved one who needs help with everyday activities and personal tasks such as transportation, managing finances, scheduling appointments, shopping, bathing, dressing, preparing meals, wound care, and or medication management. So there's a lot, a lot of responsibilities there. Robert, how would you describe your caregiving journey 
And what advice would you provide to others who may be caregiving at this moment or who may be about to uh, care, uh, become a caregiver for a friend or a family, a spouse or, or son or daughter? That's a great question. And it gets back to, you said it there, and I think I said it earlier saying that, you know, I didn't recognize myself as a caregiver. And a lot of times we are our own, uh, not worst enemy, but worst uh, in ability to assess our particular place in life uh, because, you know, we have a, a mental image of ourselves and who we are and how we live. And for many of us, that may be placed in the past or may be placed in a hopeful future. But being actually where we are is sometimes difficult to define. Uh, and understanding you're a care partner is the first step to, you know, doing your best. And then this is the difficult thing for a lot of people too, asking for help. And mm -hmm. it's one of the reasons I am such a big fan of your work at AARP. I have uh, already uh, used many of the, the services as I just turned 50 myself uh, last June, got my card and have reached out and gotten some excellent information uh, because of these life challenges that come forward. Um, you know, we, some of the current issues uh, that we talk about are, you know, driving and when is it time maybe to stop driving mm -hmm. and the transition into potentially assisted living versus, or a CCRC, I mean, even learning what a CCRC is, and now I'm understanding that, versus getting home health care. And those are important and incredibly difficult conversations to have when you're starting off. And, you know, it's my hope that we're able to share some of that as we have some of the other things we've done in our films to encourage people to say, this is is not just something you get to do, but it's something that if you embrace it, you'll love that you did. And for, you know, as someone who is in that adult child mode right now where I have children that I'm teaching and raising at the same time as I'm, I'm being a care partner, I'm really laying a legacy out very intentionally for my children to say, this is what I expect of you, too. Uh, I want you to see how I love and, you know, am working with, with my parents so that, you know, you know, you understand this is what it means uh, to, to treat your family this way. And, and I do my best to, you know, respect and honor and treat my parents with the highest amount of dignity uh, that they deserve. They've earned it. And, you know, at the same time, have sometimes those difficult conversations that say, well, this is, you know, you not seeing the situation clearly based on what I'm seeing. Maybe we need to get a third party involved so that we can, you know, peacefully try to come to a, you know, a better quality of life decision about whatever it is we're going through. So it, it takes active process. It takes really good communication skills and that, you know, if you have the baseline of a relationship of trust, you can go to those places. You know, dad and I were, we were fine, quote unquote, with each other before we went on the initial boys of summer trip. Definitely, you know, loved him. He loved me. He'd been a great father up to that point. Dad wanted more. And that really, that harkened all the way back to when he, he pitched the idea to me in 1990, knowing what a, a big A's fan I am and saying how he wanted to be closer to me. And he took me on two trips in the summer of 1990 and 91, where we saw a couple ballparks each time. And we were eventually going to get to 30, right? And that didn't happen until 2004 when life got accelerated. But what dad was showing me at that time was, you know, um, I want more yeah. from this relationship. And that incredible gift he gave me made it really honest, or I should say easy for me to, in 2004, say, dad, I want to make sure that we both get that. And when you spend two months and 20,000 miles with each other on the road, you lay it all out. And mm -hmm. it's a different type of relationship, you know, than the assumed one you have maybe when you're living in the same home or in that, you know, traditional father-son role when, you know, as you grow up. And it's like, we're going to see more eye to eye and we're going to listen more to each other, hopefully. And we're going to to see where, you know, maybe we're, we're more alike than we thought in places uh, that we, you know, we grew up with classic divides on certain things, whether they're political or otherwise, we, we'd laughingly debate and whatever else. But as we grew, we both came closer to each other. And it was amazing how that happened with, without a lot of uh, effort. And, uh, you know, I, w the effort came from recognizing that we had done that. 
So that's part of caregiving is building the relationship so you can be the type of caregiver A, you want to be and B, that, you know, uh, the, the person who's receiving the care wants you to be right. The, because I think just like Parkinson's, all care is individual. You need to know what those things are. There's a tremendous number of decisions to be made. And um, that's where, you know, getting help from AARP, which I'll definitely recommend and whoever else is in your community is helpful. Well, thank you, Robert. Yeah, and it, you know, look, it, it, you, you've you certainly, uh, you know, documented an incredible journey with your father. And, and, and uh, you've mentioned a few times, you know, during this interview, uh, you, the fact that you are a father yourself now. And so how, how did the journey with your own father allow you to connect uh, your children with your father and, and, and actually, and for you, I think, to connect with your children? How, how is it uh, help you create a meaningful inter, uh, intergenerational relationship. Yeah, well, I, I never was left wanting for more from my dad uh, in my time growing up, um, except in manners of communication. Dad is of a generation where many men just don't uh, necessarily speak emotionally, uh, don't necessarily communicate on the level that, you know, we're, we in, in a modern world, more of us just do. Uh, and, and so that was the only thing I would have wanted. And I don't think I had the tools to ask for it. And, you know, it wasn't that he was not giving me those things. So when, you know, he in, in his quieter way asked for that in that trip in 1990, 91, I could see, oh, he is asking for things. He's a man of relatively few words. So when he speaks, it's like the old EF Hutton ad, you know, you listen, you, oh, okay, he's asking for something. And that let me know, okay, that, that's our relationship. And he also has been there for the key life moments with my kids from, you know, their birth and his own. I can remember very well when my son was born, he was born with some health challenges, uh, introducing my dad to my son in the NICU and, you know, him uh, going down there and walking with him. And, and I asked dad what he thought of Giuseppe, there he is. Um, and, uh, and, and dad said, he's so much more than I thought he was going to be. So dad wanted to be a grandfather, but he didn't even know, I think for himself, what it meant to be a grandfather. And some of the very wise words <laughs> as you're seeing us in San Diego and having a wonderful time with chef Carlos there. And that has featured the whole story on that in short stop. Um, you know, we got to understand um, what it was, what, what he wanted out of being a grandfather and what I wanted out of being a dad and got to push ourselves for more. And, you know, without any complaint, it wasn't like we're trying to heal some deep divide or wound. At the same time, doesn't mean you can't want more from that. Mm -hmm. And one of the greatest compliments my dad's given me is about what he is, about how he admires what kind of father I am and how much I give to my kids. And, um, you know, uh, that goes right back to him. And uh, he's he, he talks about it in the second film. It's probably the, the greatest piece he has in his life is knowing uh, the great love and family that both my sister Chris and I have um, in, in uh, our partners and spouses and families. Um, and that gives him peace that, again, he's passed on the gift of family. So um, and seeing the kids now get to relate to mm -hmm. grandpa in this way. It's phenomenal. It really is. And, um, you know, the, the second film really allowed for that in a big way because I live in Las Vegas now. And that means that they don't get to see the grandkids as often as they would like. But during that summer, a second base, uh, dad actually got seen by an alternative medicine doctor down here for about two months. And that meant that uh, the kids at an early age got to spend some time with grandpa and he got to spend some time with them. Uh, you know, it's very different than when you visit for a day or even a week, as opposed to spending weeks of in with each other and get to really understand each other. And they've done that. And uh, it's been very interesting, too, to watch the kids see grandpa and understand he's got this thing, Parkinson's, and what does it mean to them at different stages of their life? And um how, you know, they both wish they could help and do more. And, um, you know, at the same time, love what they get from him uh, when they can spend the time. So it's all part of the journey. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, thanks, Robert. I appreciate uh, all the information you provided us. And, um, you know, we have some questions here that, that, that are queued up. And so let, let's go to some of these questions. 
Uh, one question is, do you have any tips for caregivers who are juggling multiple responsibilities? I, I think the biggest one, and you know, th this does sometimes, it, it's hard, but is to ask for help, to, to seek out uh, partnership and teamwork, to try to take some off your plate and see what you can do to delegate. I know for my sister and I, who are both uh, caregivers from a distance, we worry like crazy. And, uh, you know, when it came time to get some in-home help for mom and dad, that, that certainly relieved some of that for us, uh, that, that we were able to say, what, what it helps us do as much as, you know, having the checkpoints for mom and dad is it heightens the quality of the conversations that we have with mom and dad. We no longer have to be, say, the technical caregiver, you know, of scheduling appointments, this, that, and the other, which if you have to do because, you know, you don't have means or don't have someone who can do those things for you, of course, that, that is what it is. Mm -hmm. If you do have the opportunity to have someone help you and take those things off your plate, the ability to relate for, for me to my mom and dad as my mom and dad, as loving individuals and more about how are you and share with them, you know, how I am, that, that higher level relationship is what they'd like to have with me and, and what I'd like to have with them. And, and by no means, I, I hope I'm saying that correctly, don't mean that those other uh, tasks are low level, but they're, they're the more daily grind things um, that, that definitely need to be taken care of. And if they are taken care of, as I said, foundationally uh, by a, a friend or a, a, a caring professional, uh, that can heighten the opportunity for uh, the relationship. So asking for help or trying to find help, um, I think that's a big one. Great. Um, another question, what, what was your dad's favorite part of the journey? So the original uh, journey, if that's the uh, the 30 ballparks in 20, uh, yeah, in, in two months, 20,000 miles, um, you know, we summarize that best, I say, probably by, by playing catch. I, I think the fact that we played catch everywhere we could, you know, we'd pull over for, for breaks on the road because we average about 350 miles a day, a lot of driving, mm -hmm. um, you know, road stops and things like that. We just get out and get loose and throw the ball back and forth. And we made sure to play catch in front of every stadium we went to. It was very symbolic, uh, you know, the idea of, of a communication and just the simplicity uh, of doing that with one another as a way to connect when sometimes we had talked all we needed to talk that day, but we just mm -hmm. toss the ball back and forth. Right. So um, that was a beautiful thing it, because I know it's an inherent question and I, I want to make sure to get it out too. In case it's the favorite ballpark, uh, the favorite right. for both my dad and I was Fenway. And it, although okay. it's cliche, it's just Fenway is, is hard to beat because of its history and baseball yeah. is so much about history. Um, it, it's, it's amazing. And the way they treated us too, they, they took us on a full tour, including being on the field and interviewing Peter Gammons, who, you know, at the time was the top of ESPN's uh, baseball insiders getting on the green monster. And I think it was the first or second year they were allowing people to do that. And, uh, you know, we just, we had a phenomenal time and that was the year that they, uh, had that their, their first, uh, they broke the curse. It was 2004. Right. So, you know, the place was just, it was just simmering with you know yankee sucks chant and they weren't playing the yankees it didn't matter <laughs> so the character <laughs> and the quality of the ballpark uh was, was so infectious um other notable uh pnc in pittsburgh is gorgeous and the fans were wonderful and um the city looks amazing uh, across the backdrop uh san francisco the giants uh much to my envy have uh, an absolutely gorgeous stadium and uh, i'm very hopeful that howard terminal will be uh the uh, the crown jewel on the other side of the bay soon <laughs> yeah same same here robert and you know what you as a baseball fan you answered uh, one of my questions because i was going to ask what was your favorite ballpark and what's your dad's favorite ballpark i think it's great that you had the you both had the same ballpark so thank you for your for sharing that and um yeah uh definitely um you know we've heard that a lot about fenway park but i think it's just great that you both love that place together and it's, we're able to be there together so the only the only real problem i have with fenway is my, my wife was she joined us for parts of the trip as my mom did and fenway turn my wife into a Red Sox fan. And to this day, that irks me. <laughs> so that we've been at games in the Coliseum. And I remember one in particular, yeah. it was 
the A's were playing the Red Sox, and she's on the phone with a friend between innings. She goes, oh, yeah, I'm at the Red Sox game. I said, you are not at the Red Sox game. You're at the A's game. The Red Sox happen to be playing. Do not uh, say you're at the Red Sox so game. A, uh... <laughs> that, 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 that's what we call an unintended consequence, Robert. Oh, yeah, I know. Well, <laughs> I, I fight hard for the kids, and I've got them at this point. They're definitely let's go Oakland, and I'm, I'm very pleased with that. So That's great. Thank you so much. And, you know, for anyone who joined the live stream late, we had the opportunity with, uh, of speaking with Robert Cochran, award-winning uh, winning filmmaker and director and producer of the Boys of Summer documentary series to discuss his work and caregiving journey. The conversation is recorded, so if you missed anything, you can go back and watch it again on AARP California's Facebook or YouTube accounts. As a reminder, this Friday, we will partner with Robert and the Oakland A's for a special screening of Boys of Summer. This virtual and free screening will take place Friday, March 12th at 6 p.m. via Zoom. You can learn more about the event and register at www.bosmovie.com. We have also dropped a direct registration link in the comment box. For more about AARP's caregiving resources, visit aarp.org backslash caregiving and aarp.org slash, I'm sorry, at aarp.org backslash caregiving. You can connect with other caregivers, find resources, financial guides, videos, and more. Again, that is aarp.org backslash caregiving. You can also call AARP's toll-free toll family caregiving resource line. Agents are available to take calls Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Time at 1-877-333-5885. The support line is also available in Spanish at 1-888-971-2013. Robert, Thank you for joining us today. It's been a pleasure talking with you about this. For our viewers, we hope you all have a wonderful day. And thank you for joining us for Facebook Live webinar Wednesday conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, thank you.